How are you all doing today? Good energy in the room? Feeling good? Good, what a great conference. I want you to picture something for me. I want you to picture 30 years from now, think about your birthday in 30 years from this year, 30 years from now. And I want you to imagine a world in which over 70% of species on Earth were extinct in 30 years from today. This is not some dystopia, well it is a dystopia, but it's not some fantastical one. This is the world that will exist if we continue fishing at the rate that we're fishing today. According to the United Nations and National Geographic, in 2048 there will be no species of commercial fishing, of commercial fish left in the oceans whatsoever. Not a single species in sustainable quantities to be able to consume. Now whether you care about animal cruelty, the fact is for the US every year 50 billion sea animals are estimated to be killed for food, five times as many as all the land and air animals combined. Whether you care about environmental protection, we're all concerned what happens if a single species like the bee gets wiped out. Imagine how many keystone species are in 70% of the living beings populations in the oceans and what does that mean? From a climate change perspective, when we mess with the food chain in the oceans, we cause things like algae blooms and plankton blooms that can destroy all the coral reef, releasing quantities, unimag unimaginable quantities of carbon into the atmosphere. So the oceans are something that have been overlooked for so long and whether we're talking about animals, health and the concerns of mercury or sustainability, we must make a change and be concerned about our oceans and start taking care of them right now. Now, as people have become aware of this through the work of real visionaries like Dr. Sylvia Earle, the former uh, head of the NOAA, uh, National Oceanic Administration, and others who've spoken out, Jacques Cousteau and others who've spoken out about ocean protection, there's been a cry to attempt to solve the problem through what's known as aquaculture or fish farming. And I don't think that we have to work too hard to imagine what it is to take millions of animals and crowd them into tiny spaces and feed them tons of pesticides and hormones and antibiotics to keep them from dying and spreading disease because we already know what that's like. And now we're just replicating it in tanks right in the oceans. But just like they have manure runoff and the manure lagoons that are overspilling from pig farms into our waterways, well guess what? The tanks are already in the waterways and so all of the disease and all of the antibiotics and all of the chemicals that are using those fish farms are actually leaching into the oceans and creating huge dead zones of wild fish and coral. And if that weren't enough, most of the species that are farmed in this world are not fed plants, are not fed other farmed fish. They're actually fed wild caught fish. For some, for some fish farms, it takes 15 calories of wild caught fish to produce one calorie of farmed fish. So imagine a system where I'm so concerned about population depletion that I try to solve it by accelerating the population depletion. It is extremely broken. And so at Ocean Hugger Foods, the company that I'm so proud to have co-founded with certified master chef James Corwell, we are working to address this overfishing crisis in a sustainable, healthy, delicious, affordable, and accessible way through the cleanest of ingredients. Our first product is called Ahimi. It's made from tomatoes and it replaces raw tuna. Some of you might try, have tried it downstairs in uh, a sushi roll. And I'll tell you the story of this product, which is pretty extraordinary. My business partner, James Corwell, is a longtime chef, certified master chef. As I said, he was best new chef in New Orleans and the runner up in the Bucuz del competition, the Olympics of culinary world. And a number of years ago, he was teaching cookery, culinary work in Japan. And while, was, while he was there, he went to a place called the Tsukiji Fish Market. And the Tsukiji fish market is the largest fish market in the world. It's multiple football fields wide. 
or pitches for all those overseas. It's huge. And every single weekday for decades now, they have a tuna auction there. And at that tuna auction, Monday through Friday for decades, you will see daily sales of four million pounds of tuna. Five days a week, 52 weeks a year for decades. And because we're so used to having eaten tuna as a, as a staple food as kids when we ate it in the cans, we think of tuna as abundant. But actually, it is a, there are so many types of tuna and they are incredibly endangered. There's a reason that the most expensive fish ever sold was last week and it was many, many millions of dollars for a single tuna fish because they are so rare in certain varieties like bluefin and yellowfin that they have to be sold for that much money. And literally millions of dollars for a single fish because they know they're almost gone. And so while the chef was in Japan working in Tokyo, he visited this fish market and he saw this carnage of four million pounds of endangered fish every single day. And the chef said, can the oceans ever keep up? And he knew they couldn't. And so he came back, went into the restaurants and the exclusive membership clubs where he was cooking for some of the world's most elite. And he set aside taking all of his free time to figure out how he could solve this problem. And he thought like a chef and he thought, man, you know, I studied all this history of food. I know where the flavors of foods come from. And he knew that tomatoes are high in something called glutamic acid. And glutamic acid is the source of the flavor known as umami, which is the fifth flavor along with sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. It is very common in Asian cuisines, but it's what we would think of from truffles or other savory foods like truffles and mushrooms. And he knew that glutamic acid was very high content in tomatoes, as well as in fish and in rice and in seaweed and in all the things that we see consumed with raw fish. And so he thought, and, and he also, by the way, the way he knew that was because when he was in school learning the history of food, he found out that MSG, the synthetic version of glutamic acid, was first made by isolating glutamic acid from tomatoes in China. So the, the root of MSG before it became a synthetic chemical thing was actually taking this natural compound to create that flavoring. And so he set about taking the humble tomato and figuring out how to give it that incredible taste and texture of tuna over five years. And after all that time, he's developed this incredible proprietary process that not only works for tomatoes, but for dozens of other, other fruits and vegetables where we can extract all the flavor, all that acidity of the tomato, gone. All the sweetness of carrots, gone. Bitterness of eggplant, no more. And he takes out all that flavor and creates this fatty, chewy, firm texture that you want from fish. And then he can layer any flavor on top of it. So we can make it good for Japanese food with a little soy sauce and sesame oil. We can add some lime juice to make it for ceviche. Whatever you want to see, our technology allows us to do that. And the beautiful thing about it is that it's such a simple list of ingredients because we use a mechanical process. So we're not dousing it all kinds of chemicals. We use tomatoes and water, eggplants and water, carrots and water. And through multiple days of incredible mechanical magic, that this culinarian has created, we're able to create that texture. And uh, I'm so proud to be part of it, as you can see, because I've never seen anything like it. And it's been a few years now that I've gotten to work with a chef on this. And I think it's a game changer because there are three things we have to consider when we build sustainable businesses that can address the crises that we're seeing from factory farms, aquaculture factory farms, and the rest. One, obviously they need to taste good. That is essential. That's why I love working with an incredible chef. Two, we need to think about affordability. For so much, for so many companies in this space, we struggle with figuring out how we can be on par with the cost of the animal proteins that we're replacing. And I understand why. Actually, it's not as most people think because of the subsidies, because the subsidies are actually only a fraction of the cost savings from meat. It's because of scale 
it's because they cut corners, it's because they externalize all the devastation that they wreak on our bodies and the environment and the animals, and they make us pay for it in healthcare bills, and they make us pay for it in asthma from the air pollution, and they make us pay for it in every other way. But that doesn't mean that we can't figure out how to get to a stage where we do scale and where we can compete on price. And it's our jobs to think creatively about how we do that. And so using ingredients like tomatoes and selling them against the most expensive and premium and price volatile foods in the world, like raw sushi grade tuna, we're able to show that using the most beautiful, simple, natural ingredients, you can bring the culinary experience that people crave and are willing to throw down insane amounts of money for without having to spend their entire wallet or go broke. And so we've got taste and we've got affordability. And the last thing which really matters today in this world is we've got to be an authentic mission-based uh, mission business. And I'm proud of the chef and his leadership in showing that the culinary world has a voice and a stand to take in making a difference in this world, taking their expertise around food and showing that food can be delicious and good for you and good for the world. And I'm proud that mission is driven into our core from the beginning. We are thinking about how we can address this sustainability issue around the oceans across the board. The next product we're launching is one of the least sustainable fish in the world. It's the freshwater eel. And freshwater eel are what are used for unagi, the uh, eel that is found in sushi. And it's also what they, use in, what they used to use in the UK for a dish that I hear is not too popular there anymore and which I probably would never have eaten even before I was vegan, uh, called jellied eels, which isn't what I wouldn't be going for. But um, the reason it's so unsustainable is because they haven't figured out how to farm uh, freshwater eel from birth because they're not able to make them reproduce pro pro properly in farms and the young don't survive in the farms. So what they've figured out they have to do is they have to go into the natural freshwater bodies and they have to harvest live the freshwater eel before reproductive age and then move them onto the farms where they will never reproduce. So just think about that for a second. If you want a really good way to decimate a population, you don't let them reproduce. That is a very effective tool to destroy an entire species. And what we've found is in the problems that it's causing, just from an economic standpoint, we are, uh, we are very honored to have one of the largest publicly traded Japanese food companies in the world be our investor and distributor in our company, one of many. And this company was the world's largest distributor of unagi until two years ago. And you know what? They just placed their first order for our product, and guess what they're no longer selling? They do not sell any more freshwater eel because it's not sustainable and because it's so expensive because the supply is so broken, it actually went up 8x in price last year. Eight times in price. Imagine if I told you that a tomato was a pound, a dollar a pound today, and then in six months it was eight dollars a pound. Would you buy that? That's nuts. And that's what's happening when we wreak havoc on so many species that billions of coaster fishermen rely on for sustenance, that we rely on for protection from climate disaster, that we rely on for being able to supply us with all kinds of uh, nutritional, functional, I mean beyond the fish, I mean the things they're feeding from the algae and everything else. Without the fish, we have none of that. So the disaster this causes is so serious. We're proud to be part of the solution. Um, I hope you'll uh, support us. We're available across the country and in Canada. We sell the product, uh, this first product in, in Whole Foods of the sushi bars. You can find which stores on our store locator. We also sell through institutional food service providers like Aramark, Sodexo, Bon Appetit, Restaurant Associates, Guggenheimer. So we're in a ton of like Silicon Valley corporate and college cafeterias, um, restaurants, universities, stadiums, all kinds of things. We really love what we support and I'd love to take any questions. Yes. I have a question. I don't know if you can I don't know if you can answer this for me, but I work for a university. We have a distribution arm where we do full service um, mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the plant based and companies when we order their product, they don't just ship it. 
Mm -hmm. They have to come and show it. Mm -hmm. So does your company have that same stipulation? We much prefer it. Yeah. Well, let me, the challenge for us sure. is that our rep from the distribution company has about 75, 80 accounts. Sure. So, so to schedule that appointment with that person to get them to come in and show us the product is really challenging. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to hear your reasoning behind that mm -hmm. and how maybe we could facilitate making it easier to get some of these products. Absolutely. So. I'll tell you why we, so the question was, do you require that your product be shown to the chefs that you're selling to instead of just sent to them? And the answer is we really prefer it. And the reason is we are a company that takes culinary experience very seriously. And by not selling packaged to the consumer on the shelf, we are putting a barrier between ourselves and those who are consuming it. Uh, and that is the hands of the chefs. And some chefs are extraordinary, and some chefs are not. And that's not a criticism of them, it's a recognition that the industry has to feed billions of people, and sometimes that means that there are different levels of skill, and different levels of experience. Not that our product is complicated, but just like raw fish, you'd want to treat it with care. In fact, it's a lot easier to handle because there's no liability, there's no safety issue, you're not dealing with all kinds of foodborne illness. Um, and it's very similar in handling. It's handling. It's frozen. You thaw it and you cut it. And you serve it. But we really care that our products be presented properly. And there are some nuances. I'll give you an example. It's something so minor, but such a big deal. If you look at our product, um, we actually have tomatoes. We don't blend that and break it up. And so if you look at our product, there's one half that's beautiful and smooth, and there's the other half that's the inside of the tomato, which is ribbed and ugly. So just having them showcase it right side up is a huge deal. It's a small thing, but we've seen when we go to a, to a store and they serve it the wrong way, and it looks like it's been chewed up, and it's exactly the same product, but that can really hurt presentation and experience. So we do prefer it for it to be experienced. The other thing is that as a company that's building a brand, we've taken five years to develop this process. You'll see that other people in restaurants do occasionally make tomato, sushi, whatever they call it, but this process took five years and requires a lot of equipment to make. And our brand is very important to us to protect the integrity and quality of the product and the perception of it. And so ensuring that people understand how to present it in a way that properly represents us and our mission and everything else is very important to us. In terms of how we can work with places to make it easier for them, we have representatives all across the country, chefs and salespeople who can come in with or without the distributor. We work very closely with our distributors, so they often welcome our doing that. And we want to be creative. We've also made videos and all kinds of flyers to walk people through. We have recipe booklets so that we can help provide a lot of support and we provide an insane amount of marketing support. Um, for people that have, your situation is a little different because you have a private enterprise, but for people who have places that are open to the public, like stores or restaurants, we will do all kinds of geo-targeted social media advertising to get people in the door, because it's our job to help sell through. Um, so we would create flyers for you or kind of whatever you needed. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Yes. It's a great question. The question was, when was our eel coming to market? Um, as I said, the tomato product is called ahimi, means the spirit of ahi. Uh, mi means spirit of, ahi is tuna in Hawaiian. Uh, and you'll recognize mi from surimi, which is that imitation crab meat, which is not vegetarian. Uh, it's made from pollock and other kind of chum white fish. Um, but so we use that same naming convention and we made these names like that. So ahimi is our tuna. Our eel is called unami, like unagi, but it's the spirit of eel. Um, and it will be in the market very soon. Um, we have it produced and on its way to the shore. Um, and it will be ready soon. Um, but I can't tell you where it will be selling yet. Uh, it will be very exciting. And it will start out in a limited set of locations. And you will see it expand from there. Um, we're also, for those of you who are international, we also will be bringing the product overseas. As I said, we have partners who distribute all over the world, like our Japanese partner. They distribute in 40 countries, and they've already pledged that they will be bringing us to all of those countries, so all over Western Europe, all over uh, Asia, all over, uh, actually Asia Pacific, so in Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, you know, we have partner, this partner 
covers the whole world. So we do plan to be everywhere. We're super excited for that. But EEL is, is next step, and that will be two months max. <laughs> Before it's like sold into your hands. Yes? I was wondering if you anticipate ever going into the retail market. The great question. The question was, do we ever anticipate going to the retail market? So um, I've been a consultant in the plant-based food space for 10 years. And I work with a lot of companies to help them get to market and think through how they should sell and everything else. And we made a very intentional decision to launch this product in what's called food service, which is prepared foods, caterers, restaurants, cafeterias, whatever it may be. And I'm sharing this story only because I think it's important for you all to think about if you're entrepreneurs or launching your own companies, I want to make sure that you think about how do you optimize your chances of success by aligning your product with where it makes sense. And so our reason for going into food service was that 96% of sushi consumed in the United States is purchased outside the home as a finished sushi roll. And that's true for poke, and that's true for ceviche and tartare. Now, we surmise that the reason is that people are intimidated by the idea of making raw fish dishes because they're scared of the food safety, and also that the cuisines are cuisines that are not traditional to the United States, and so it feels intimidating from a culinary and skill standpoint, too. We do not have those same challenges that would come from handling raw fish, but since nobody ever had to learn how to roll sushi before, we'd have to teach them. And that's a whole lot of money that we'd be spending on educating people about something that's unrelated to just getting them to buy the product. So we decided to put it in the hands of the chefs who are selling the same stuff every day. It comes frozen in a bag just like the fish. It's handled just like the fish. It's sold just like the fish. And so we decided to sell it that way. So we don't anticipate that with this exact product or the next couple that are replacing raw fish that we will sell in a retail pack as is in the near future. We may have future products that we will do that with, and what we are exploring is, is there a way that we can pair our product with other ingredients or in a value-add dish or setting where you don't require the consumer to do any work and they can experience it not just as the product itself, but as a, as a finished dish. Um, and that way we could sell it in a packaged way. But, um, you know, we are in a very enviable but also painful position of having significantly more demand than we can supply. And everybody's like, that's so great. It's such a great problem to have. It is a lot better problem to have when you don't get calls from customers who are saying, I told you I'd place and I, I told you, you know, where's my delivery of a million dollars of product? And I'm like, I know, don't go away. Um, so right now it's hard for us to think about, we were just asked earlier about retail, it's hard for us to justify stopping the line to create a new pack size and do all these things when we're trying to just pump out what we have already. Other questions? Yes, Jim. Uh, yeah, where does this fall in the nutritional spectrum? You know. Absolutely. So uh, I want to thank Jim. Jim's actually one of our ge very generous investors in our company, so thank you so much. Um, so he asked about the nutritional information on our product. It's a great question. Our product is extremely clean ingredients, which means it doesn't have a lot of the crap that comes in fish. It also doesn't have some of the stuff that some people would want. So um, our product has zero cholesterol, obviously, because it's vegan. Um, it has zero fat. So there is less than a, there's less than two tenths of a gram of fat per full uh, serving. So three ounces of protein is the amount that would usually go in a sushi roll or in a poke bowl. And so what you put with it, the rice or anything else, would add to it. But from just our product, just the protein replacement, it's no fat. It's 25 calories in a full serving, um, and it's got none of the mercury or any of that stuff, of course. Um, it doesn't have much protein. Uh, we do see a lot of chefs who are pairing it with quinoa or other things instead of rice to make it even higher in protein, but that's one thing we don't have. This product does not have omega-3s, but our other products do, and we will be coming out with a future version of this product, which will as well. And that will be obviously plant-based omega-3 protein as well, or omega-3, uh, yeah, as well. Thank you so much. It's my time. I really thank you for, for coming to hear me speak. Come on down and say hi to us at the table, and.